You can listen to the Backward Compatible Podcast anytime, anywhere, and any way you like. Subscribe and listen to us on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Then, join the discussion. It's got Jeff Loeb's dirty fingerprints all over yeah. it. <laughs> this week on Backward Compatible... Ben Miro joins us once again to discuss the state of comics in the age of digital distribution and transmedia. Plus, Ben pitches a few classic films that are ripe for interesting video game adaptations. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to podcast number nine. I'm Chris, and I'm joined here once again by Ben Mira, our special guest. Hello. And uh, we got Jim down in Houston. Hey, I'm here. Sort of. <laughs> Jim is here, kind of, sort of, in spirit, via the internet. The internet is kind of the in spirit of the modern age, I guess, in a way. <laughs> it's a digital glue holding us all together. Something like that, yeah. Bridges people, connects them. Yep. Well, it's also like the force in the sense then that it's got the light side and the dark side, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Jim's midichlorian count is low. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, yeah, uh, we're just here. We're going to be talking a little bit today about, uh, I guess, comics was one of the topics we're going to be talking a bit about. Um, but first, we had a, a little bit of an icebreaker that Jim came up with. So, Jim, how about you uh, tell us about that? Oh, okay. Well, uh, I was speaking with Ben uh, earlier, and he was talking about how he had seen a lot of older movies lately and so i thought it'd be interesting if he could sort of pitch some of the older movies that he's seen and then chris and i coming more from a game gaming background could try to come up with a way that we could design a game that might work to sort of adapt that that film or at least elements of the film nice i like it yeah I, i've been you know since the alamo draft house opened right down the street i've been going to all these uh retro film occasions uh seeing lots of stuff on 35 millimeter lots of old stuff um and it's a different vibe different feeling in person uh you know seeing these films with a with a an auditorium filled with people um rather than at home it's a very different vibe for sure and you know it's interesting with 35 millimeter and stuff like that you go to like, you know, you buy, like, the digitally remastered or whatever and try to watch it at home. But it's not quite the same as seeing it projected up on the big screen. You know, right. you can sort of tell that that yeah. format was meant for theater, essentially. But, yeah, there's a there's a tactile quality to those prints that's mm -hmm. totally missing on Blu-ray or, or in digital projection, even 4K. Um, but I got a, a, a real easy one for you. Uh, uh, it'll be easy for Jim, anyway, I imagine. <laughs> um, uh, Seven Samurai. Mm-hmm. Oh, Seven Samurai. Yeah. Um, I think it's got all of all of the elements of like a classic RPG. Really? Because I actually would go a different way with it. Um, I'd actually, I'd actually kind of like because I've been playing a lot of arcade games lately. So you'd so go eight bit side scroll. I would, I would go eight bit side scroll. Uh, probably not eight bit. I think sixteen bit side scrolling, uh, beat 'em up. Yeah. Kind of like one of the one of the old um, uh, like Double Dragon that sort of thing. But you can play with set like. You know seven different characters i think because it you know th that way it kind of has that sort of synergy between um the title <laughs> and the gameplay seven player co-op seven player <laughs> co-op which we can do now online we could we could uh it would take you would have to have a very big screen like everybody would have to really be small on the screen so you got enough real estate to accommodate everyone or you no, could do because if it's online then they don't have to all be on the same screen at the same time that's a good point actually yeah you can have everyone has their own camera that follows them around what they did for the X Men arcade game, uh, arcade <laughs> machine that was actually six player, um, they re they actually did use two monitors instead of just one, huh. so that you could fit everyone on screen. They used two monitors right next to each other, and they were both um, horizontally aligned, so that you got like a really really wide space. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I think one of the uh, I took a I took a friend to see it who hadn't seen it before, mm -hmm. and um, you know he was kind of dreading sitting through this nineteen fifties. Japanese, three and a half hour long, <laughs> subtitled movie. It sounds pretty awesome to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is. Yeah, and it's one a of classic. The, one of the things he said after the after the the movie was like, "It's more modern than I thought it was." Mm. Yeah, because 
it sort of created the action movie. Sure. In yeah. a sense mm-hmm. that it, it's constantly compelling and it's very funny. So, oh, I, yeah. you know, I was thinking RPG in the sense that um, the player gets to make those uh, relationships with the other players and the NPCs hmm. also, because I think that's where the movie sort of thrives. Those um, relationships with the villagers, with and, the villagers. Uh, and the samurai. And, yeah. yeah. And I all those, really little, those little subplots with the, the villagers, like, reject them, but mm-hmm. need them. <laughs> and, like, they don't want the samurai, like, getting too close to their women, mm. you know? So one dresses up as a man and, you know, uh, one of the one of the villagers' daughters. You know, all those little nuances, I think, would be really good uh, gameplay-wise mm. or interactive narrative-wise. Uh, the problem with an RPG, though, especially when you're adapting a film, is that RPGs typically have an expectation of being longer games, um, especially because you have all these sort of interactions that, with NPCs um, that require you know more times for like dialogue and for exploration of the town and that sort of stuff, plus all the gameplay. Um, so in that case, I'd wonder like how we'd address the issue of taking, you know, it's still a three and a half hour film. It's a very long film, The Seven Samurai, but then turning that into like a potentially 20, 30 hour plus RPG story. Every samurai gets a backstory. It's a good thought, yeah. Yeah. And, and Mifune's character is not a samurai. Mm. I mean, and within the text of the film, you sort of find out that he's, you know, basically a peasant who's claimed a samurai's identity. Huh. Spoilers. <laughs> um, but, you know, in gameplay, you could, you know, play that. Sure. That'd be pretty cool. Jim? And so you sort of have a, a series of sort of prequel chapters where you see each of them on their own, how they sort of came to be, and then they meet up, and yeah. then you have this adventure, yeah? It's pretty yeah, cool. Have you have you played? Um, I believe they do it in the saga games, but I know they do it in um, in Sweet Code N three, where you could pick. Um, if they're both RPGs. You could pick a player that you start with, and then you start with their backstory, and before they meet up with the full group, and you could maybe do something similar with uh, Seven Samurai. So you could sort of have like players could get a different experience in the RPG depending on which samurai that they choose to portray first before eventually getting joining the group and having mm-hmm. uh, the same experience that sort of comes together. A bunch of like, branching plot lines at, at the start that kind of all merge into one. It changes your perception of the narrative. Right. And you're allowed to form a bond with every all seven characters. Mm-hmm. Or choose maybe you know, who not to form a bond with. So, I mean, you know, games being interactive, <clears throat> just because it's adapting an existing story doesn't mean it has to go the same way necessarily. So it would be interesting to see some more freedom there as far as... Uh, you know, maybe the way I'm playing my character, I don't like this particular samurai, so I'm going to not have them be very good friends and see how that sort of affects things down the road. I, I, I'm actually kind of curious now. There's got to be a Seven Samurai video game. Um, I'll look it up real quick. I would be cool. shocked if there was not. Yeah, there's well, got to be something somewhere. Yeah. There, there was a Seven Samurai um, anime, uh, yep. sort of a reimagining of it, which admittedly was not really that good but uh, it was interesting had a good production value now um 47 ronin this new one with keanu reeves that's not the same story no no okay (laughs) i I didn't think so now that i think of it's like it was actually called 47 that's i think that has a bunch of like dragons and demons i heard it wasn't very good and like they showed it to japanese audiences and they were just like totally appalled by it yeah which (laughs) (laughs) i i i completely ignorant about it but i seem to recall it's based on some kind of folklore japanese folklore. yeah i believe it is yeah but they maybe took it to an absurd level I yeah don't know. kind of um creative license with an old story and that's usually a bad idea unless you do it really really well yeah oh, so i found i found the video game there is one one um it is actually a reimagining of the story in uh the future it's called seven samurai 20 xx <laughs> and, and let me read i'll read the description here um it's the year porno. is 20 xx and the setting is japan uh-huh. humans and humanoids uh the latter being various mutants cyborgs robots maintain a delicate balance in a large unnamed city where the, pow- the power and balance of the city is maintained by a large structure known as the steeple of light mm. its source of power is a young girl named the child of heaven when the child is stolen by the humanoids in order to break the balance and initiate war the child then goes missing from her inhuman captors and is held by several villagers to ransom the city for money. Let's see. When the humanoids and various agents of the city set out to retrieve her and her sacred jewel, the villagers quickly find themselves in danger and look for samurai, known in the game as hunt as hunters. 
to protect them. <laughs> hmm. Hunters and samurai, I think, are almost two very different mindsets. Yeah, diametrically opposed. Yeah, like samurai are defenders primarily, yeah? Yeah. It, it so. does specifically say that it was at least trying to uh, loosely base, it, base the story around uh, Seven Samurai. Oh, wow. Hmm. So I, I've never played it, but I actually remember hearing about the game. In fact, I'm looking, and there is a picture of the... Um, I think it's a Seven Samurai. What, what's, what passes for the Seven Samurai in this game um, on the Wikipedia page? Huh. One one of them looks like a looks kind of like Danny DeVito playing the Penguin from Batman Returns. Of course. <laughs> so I remember him from the movie. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Very nice. So, do you uh, have any other old films, Ben, that you want to throw out there and see what we can do with it? Um, uh, let's see. I'm trying to think of ones I recently saw. So, um. This might be too close to Seven Samurai, um, but uh, the Wild Bunch. Wild Bunch. Yeah. Don't, don't think I've heard of that one. Really? Really? It's an old Jim? Western. I've actually not seen it though. It's uh, late '60s. It's you know considered one of the most uh, making finger quotes violent <laughs> films of all time. Okay. Uh, when you see it now, you're like, oh yeah, that's nice. <laughs> um, but it, it's basically about a bunch of uh, uh, mercenaries. Uh, who uh, take a job, are screwed over, some bounty hunters come after them, they decide to take another job for like a, a, a like a Mexican despot type, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, get screwed over again, ah. and decide to suicide mission, run up against the Mexican despot, even though they're going to die, it's for honor. Gotcha. Um, which... I don't know. It might make a nice change of place from uh, most video games that have you like doing something for loot or for you know to win. Mm-hmm. It, the win state being you die, but you die with honor. Sure, yeah, it might be interesting. I don't know. Yeah, there there have been video games that have explored um, characters doing things for sort of personal reasons, not sort of necessarily for the sensible reason. Um, but yeah, typically there is kind of an incentive for the player, you know, kind of the in the interest of fun or whatever, um, to get loot or to like you know win in spectacular fashion, that sort of thing. But the whole idea of kind of the suicide mission for personal reasons is not super common in games, as far as I'm aware, or at least not no. that I'm thinking of. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I can't really think of any um, examples aside from certain times when they force you into it like the ending for red dead redemption yeah mm-hmm. you uh you kind of know you're going to be killed but you go out there anyway because and that um kind of frees your family from the obligation that you kind of have brought brought to them mm-hmm. that to uh, their doorstep. that being one of the few games i've actually ever played <laughs> uh to its conclusion that, oh, okay. that is aesthetically very similar to the wild bunch yeah i was about to say it's red dead redemption is also a wild west sort of setting yeah. so that's pretty interesting um, it sounds to me too like this one would have to probably be a bit more linear or at least there's going to be choke points in the narrative where um, pretty much it's going to come down to you getting screwed over by your employer you know once twice however many times throughout the story um, so if there is any player choice in this it's going to have to be sort of funneled in a way you know I just um, we have the convenience of sitting across from my blu-ray uh, collection <laughs> And uh, I'll tell you something that I would love to see in a video game, and I would, you know, probably play it if it was $30 um, or, or lower. <laughs> um, a good, a good open-world Rambo game. That could be cool. Like Far oh, Cry 3, really cool. Tom- yeah, Tomb Raider uh, kind yeah. of. Uh, and not cons- maybe have it so that... It- the chapters reflect the various movies. Mm-hmm. So I think there's something good about all four movies. Uh, I'm that weirdo. <laughs> I, I even like the third really shitty yeah, one. It's, nice. It's, it kind of has sort of a B-movie appeal to it. Are you Have you watched it recently? Um, it's been about two, three years. Uh, yeah, Rambo's helping out Al-Qaeda. You no, know? no, I remember that part. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I remember that part. But the uh, whole movie is, is very kind of like... Oh, it's, oh, it's really... canon films to the yeah. max. Um, it's a but very ma- different tone from the first one and the fourth one. Yeah. Hey, which is really strange politically because those movies act as anti-war. The first and the fourth one. Mm. Anti-war yeah. sort of screeds when... Is the fourth one that came out recently? 
Yes. 2006. It's oh, okay. Yeah. It's excellent. When I say recently, this is like grad school mind where like all the years just sort of blur together. So yeah. yes, recently. <laughs> yeah. Cool. <laughs> it wasn't 1988. Right. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. I, I, w- I would actually, you know, love to, you know, see that first, first blood movie in a game, play it so, uh, to me. That's the, it's the best one. It's the most complete sort of character and narrative. Uh, yeah. I agree from a character standpoint. It's definitely, I think, it'd be the hardest one to adapt to a video game. Yeah. Um, but it would be the most interesting, the most different. Do you think it would be more hard because he's killing cops? Uh, no, actually, because you kill cops in, for example, Grand Theft Auto. Mm. Yeah, so that's it's, true. It's, it's common in some video games, so I wouldn't say... Um, I don't think that would necessarily pose a problem from a censorship standpoint, if that's what you're thinking. Yeah. Uh, I, I, think, I think the problem is just that the tone is... It's it it's such a dark story and not dark as as gamers usually like to think where it's oh yeah it's it's mega violent or it um, no, sort of has this, like melodrama to it but it doesn't it's it's not that sort of darkness it's a, it's a legitimate internal um, turmoil yeah mm. and it's very sort of introspective and um, philosophical even yeah and that's something that you don't see a lot in video games and those and the ones that you do um, tend to be less very less um action oriented right and rambo kind of has a first blood uh specifically kind of has like strikes a balance between having that action and um, the more introspective moments so it'd be it, it'd make for oh geez almost a kind of a multiple personality video game just kind hmm. of like split personas i'd be i'd be curious about a video game where violence is a uh is a part of the game. Um, it's it's the, in the vernacular of the gameplay, but also it's frowned upon at the same time. I mean, that's sort of sort of the interesting thing about First Blood is that every act of violence that he commits is a tragedy mm-hmm. in and of itself. Right. Um, it it's not good. He's not winning. I think that there are some video games that do that, honestly. Um, none in particular coming to mind, but, you know, I think even, you know, taking Grand Theft Auto, for example, you know, that's very much laden with satire and stuff like that. But at the same time, I think there's a tonality to it that comes across is for all the, the violent things you're doing, all the illegal things you're doing, it's um, it's not really glorifying it, I don't think. For especially yeah um i I think that grand theft auto among other series will have all this violence and have you carry them out but it's more of a a critique of that violence than it is like you know glorifying it Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so so uh uh, ben or or chris have you guys played um the rambo game that came out earlier this year no i didn't even know Uh -uh. neither neither did i i was i've been looking (laughs) stuff up on uh (laughs) cheating yeah um (laughs) but uh, I, i looked it up and apparently there was a Rambo release for um, PCs, uh, Xbox 360, and PS3. It must have um, really in sucked. In February, and it really did. It got <laughs> it, it got ratings in the um, 30s and 20s. Oh wow! Like, oh my for god! For example, Metacritic gave the PS3 version a 23 out of 100. Wow! And th- this is coming from an industry that will like give you a 90 automatically if you have enough hype. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. IGN specifically gave it a three out of 10. What it, some- said, it said uh, the game mechanic feels like an unmitigated waste of time for everybody involved. Huh. Uh, Destructoid gave it a 1 out of 10, claiming that even the act of shooting doesn't feel impactful or fun. <laughs> Whoa! But it, but it actually adapts. Um, I, I, I got kind of excited when I first saw it because it, apparently it adapts um, all of the films. And, oh, really? and like one of the pictures has um, is clearly from First Blood, where you see one of the cops coming after him and Rambo hiding behind a tree yeah. um, with his uh, knife in hand. Is it, so I, uh, is it the likeness of Sylvester Stallone or is it kind of a generic Rambo that they made up? Oh no, it's it's meant to be. You can see it, you know, Sylvester Stallone's face prominently displayed on the uh, cover so of the video game. He signed off on it. <laughs> in theory, yeah. Um, he, he got paid for it at the very least. He yeah. probably got, he got paid for it, but I don't see him listed anywhere in terms of like writing credits. He owns the character. Mm. Yeah, he, Straight he probably... Up. Right, but he probably, I assume, signed on. God for damn money. it! <laughs> <laughs> At so. least, do you, Jim, you probably uh, remember this. Do you? Do you guys know about the Rambo Saturday morning cartoon? Yes. Oh, yeah. 
I think I've heard of this at some point, but it's great. a very real thing. <laughs> There was a Rambo Saturday morning cartoon. Like for kids? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now, I used to watch it too when I was when I was growing up. Of course you did. And <laughs> so did I. Chris, you're gonna need to uh, when when you actually air this, you're gonna need to like pause the discussion, play the intro so we can get the good version of it. Uh, oh yeah. Like good audio. <laughs> and then we just can continue talking about yeah. it. Alright. So he, here's the Rambo theme song <laughs> now. Uh, so that just happened. I think if I if I'm remembering correctly, and I'm not even going to bother to research it. It's like he put together a, a a team of freedom fighters. I think it was called Rambo and his freedom fighters. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I'm going to look it up right now. Yeah, I think it's something like that. And it's kind of like Captain Power, like with, uh-huh. but with Rambo. It's like a bunch of kids. <laughs> what? And shirtless Rambo and the, the force of freedom. Is, oh, is the oh my goodness! <laughs> Rambo, the force of freedom. Only the eighties. Oh yeah. man! And it ran for sixty-five episodes. What the fuck? <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I didn't know that. That's a couple of seasons at least. Oh my god! That's like well, three seasons. Yeah. <laughs> I I think you have to cre- make a certain number of episodes so you can go into syndication. Yeah. For like the television rules, and so I, I'm sure that's why they produce that many. It was by a uh, um the Ruby and Spears company, which did a lot of those sort of adaptations. Yeah. The Ruby Spears. Um, but yeah, it only it actually only ran for one year. Um, actually, no, it only ran for apparently a few months in 1986. But I'm sure in syndication it must have kept re-airing because I would have been a little bit I would have been a little bit too young to watch it when it first came out. I would have been uh, 12, which no, means I was way too old to be watching it. <laughs> yeah, I would have been four. So, but I, but I was watching it. <laughs> but um, I did like the thing you mentioned the uh, the Far Cry style game, and actually, oh, I, mean, yeah. I was thinking too. You could even mix in some elements of um, the new Metal Gear Solid Five, where they've got kind of the open world stealth stuff. So you're yeah. scouting situations out, kind of like moving freely, trying to tactically figure out how you're going to handle the situation. I could see that fitting Rambo really well. I thought I loved Far Cry Three, however. I thought the story was so dumb. Oh yeah. <laughs> that when I was playing it, was. it, I was like, "Oh, this would be so much better if I was Rambo." <laughs> and like, yeah. if I was Rambo, I would shove that guy's mohawk straight up his ass. Uh, <laughs> Have I ever told you what the definition of insanity is? <laughs> <laughs> did, did you play uh, Blood Dragon? Yes. Yeah. Much better. That was the one I liked. Uh, yes. I thought they, they didn't really care about having a, a serious story. This was just a straight up parody story, and it was actually a lot more enjoyable. Oh yeah, same engine, of course. Yeah, no, yeah, that was great. I actually would love to see the movie, the canon films from 1987. <laughs> yeah, Blood Dragon. That'd be awesome. Uh, Mark DeCasas. Who who else would be in there? Uh, you know that. This are, there's a Russian bad guy who who's in every. He's in Rambo Two. He's in Beverly Hills Cop. Mm. Put that guy in there. Uh, so kind of on a semi-related topic, have you guys um, seen The Expendables at all? Mm-hmm. Or like, I'm guessing it, 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 I get the impression it's not the greatest of films, but kind of like a fun action flick with all these old timers, so to speak. I actually hate them. Okay. Yeah, yeah I don't I don't like them either, to be honest. I, I it, think that they, they're a little exploitative, I guess, I guess mm-hmm. you could call it. Like they're kind of pandering to, trying to pander to a certain crowd, which I guess would be I don't ben, know. But yeah. it doesn't really work. Huh. To me, the saddest thing about them, and I haven't seen the third one and probably won't. Because uh-huh. like they brought that one down to PG-13, too. Yeah. Which is like, what's the point? <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. yeah. I didn't even know that. I, I, I didn't keep up with it. I only I, saw the first I don't two. even care. Mm. I mean, I feel like um, the, the saddest thing for me is it, is it makes me realize that those guys don't understand what's special about those movies mm-hmm. at all. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I'm not so sure, though, because... Um, 
Sylvester Stallone did somewhat recently um, make the new Rambo film, and it was great. So yeah, that's... maybe maybe he maybe he doesn't get the the other side, like the sort of like um, B movie ish, over the top, super macho side of the um, of his action films. He only kind of understands the more. The, the introspective, darker elements? I don't, no, I, I'll disagree with that. In that I just finished watching like all six Rocky movies like fairly close together. Uh-huh. And they're almost a meta-textual comment on his career. Huh. Like the first one is very personal and mm-hmm. very serious and not about boxing, although mm-hmm. plot is boxing. Right, right. Um, yeah. It was sort of like where we were as a country right around that time, sure. around 76. Mm-hmm. The second one, it's like, which he he wrote all of them. Okay. Oh, yeah. He directed two, three, four, and six. Okay. Um, and what you start to see is Rocky morphs from this sort of emotionally vulnerable chatterbox sort of idiot mm-hmm. into a superhero, into a cartoon character. Mm-hmm. And then he comes back to being a normal, regular, the, per- the character we fell in love with. Okay. Uh, Interesting. Uh, it's it, yeah, like you said, it's kind of a commentary on uh, what fame will do to someone, and once they sort of figure out what it's done to them, then they sort of go back to being themselves eventually. So it, it's what yeah. it did to Stallone. Yeah, I mean, he he is capable of making smart, character-driven small stories, uh-huh. Uh-huh. and then he'll get some success from that story, mm-hmm. and then go and make a huge piece of shit, hmm. and and then get knocked down and then do it again mm. it's incredible i mean like if you look at his his cv from the 80s to the 90s it's like great film okay film piece of shit piece of shit piece of shit great film you know it, I, yeah i think he's, he's kind of amazing in that regard <laughs> no I, I i mean i i'm a I'm, really big uh, fanboy of Sylvester Stallone. I've seen all of his stuff, and I actually absolutely love the Rocky franchise. Yeah. Um, I even love the the middle ones where they start to get really campy. I love it for a different reason than I than the first than the first one and the last one, but yeah. I still really enjoy them. The only one I kind of can't stomach is the fifth one, and I think I'm probably not alone on that. I, I, I think I, you I should watch even, it again. I haven't seen the fifth because it's like I can't find it anywhere. It's right well, there. It, huh? it, <laughs> it's sort of, it's sort of. I think, I, I think it didn't go far enough in either direction because it kind of has some camp to it with the ridiculous rap songs throughout. Oh, that, like, yeah. makes it make no sense. And that one guy who's like the boxing promoter. But oh, he's really more like he's really more like a pimp than a boxing promoter. It's like the weirdest thing. <laughs> he was Don King, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but he was like he was like the pimp version of Don King. But what happens to him? You know, it's great. That, that movie's oh, at the, at the, yeah, at the end where he like gets punched in the face, and then yeah. Rocky, Rock, like, the guy's like, oh, "Don't punch me, I'll sue. Don't punch me, I'll sue." And then Rocky punches them in the face, yeah. and he's like, "Ah, oh, go ahead, I don't have anything." So, yeah, <laughs> sue me for what? Cool. That's very funny. Yeah. Uh, no, I think five is better than. Four actually wasn't four the one with the uh, Russian. Yeah. Are you right, kidding? Right. Four. Four is the ultimate '80s camp movie. It's yeah. the ultimate one. You yeah, but it's lost. also it's it's so terrible. <laughs> oh, it is terrible, but it's 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 lovingly terrible. It um. You love to hate it. One one of the <laughs> things that um I I don't hate it. It's just not good. Um, and one of the things I I don't like about it is that when Apollo dies, it's Rocky's fault. Apollo dies. Mm. Um, and that's never addressed in the it, in the it film come again. Back to it, yeah, yeah, at yeah. all. Mm. And, and he barely speaks, mm. which drives me crazy because when Rocky starts like going into chatterbox mode, mm-hmm. it's fucking great. Yeah, it's yeah. always so funny. Why does Paulie have a robot in that movie? <laughs> because it was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I, and the, I wanted one of those robots too when I first the saw that movie. The robot falls in love with Polly. Come on. Yeah, it's great. He, re- <laughs> he reprograms. The, I don't know. I don't know if you've seen the movie, Chris. I have. But I have. I have. He he reprograms the robot to have a female voice, so that like basically, it sound, every time the robot talks to him, it sounds like she's hitting on him. Yeah. It's like kind of creepy and weird. He hacks the robot <laughs> to be his sex uh, slave or something. I don't know. Uh, There's a great scene in four where. Uh, Apollo is is pitching Rocky and Adrian on fighting Drago mm. at the beginning, and, uh-huh. and it's a very impassioned like 
Carl Weathers like, no, I, I got to get in there and fight this guy. He's attacking us mm-hmm. and our values. Mm-hmm. And in comes that fucking robot <laughs> into the scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sylvester Stallone directed this movie. <laughs> <laughs> and that robot, and, and it, the scene stops and Carl Weathers looks at that robot. What is that? <laughs> it's either brilliant or, or totally... Uh. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, the uh, the reason I bring this up is because um, there was actually recently a. Uh, this is going back to the Expendables thing. Um, the guys yeah. who made Bro Force, which if you guys haven't played, I think you guys would love it. Um, a really fun side-scrolling 2D action game. It's got co-op if you want it to be, um, but it's basically just like a love letter letter to action films for the past like three, four decades. Oh, nice. Um, and it's it's way over the top. The presentation is hilarious. Um, like they changed the names of everyone, so it's like instead of Rambo, it's Ram Bro. Like they put bro into everyone's Swell. names. Um, so it's really fun game. But um, they actually made a free version of it called the Expenda Bros, which I guess was like a licensed sort of spinoff of the film. Um, and when I was playing that, it seemed like it was kind of cool. But again, you know, sometimes the game can be better than the film and vice versa. So are, are you saying this was a licensed thing? It was licensed. Oh, yeah. wow. Um, so they had like, you know, all the big stars kind of as their characters in this game. And I think it's better when you've played the um the uh, the bro force before uh, because then you sort of like understand how the game's supposed to work. I don't think it would make much sense to anyone who is coming at it like this is the Expendables game and they're like, what is this? You know right. what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm looking at it. I'm looking at the information about the game right now. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a run and gun cooperative game. Uh, looks like it has a whole bunch of '80s icons: uh, John McClane, Chuck Norris, Mr. T, uh, Ripley, Sarah Connor. Hmm. Uh, I have a picture here, and it looks like it's showing um, Snake Plissken, Robocop, yep. Yep. Uh, Judge Dredd. <laughs> like, pretty much like all the big 80s, 90s action films are, are in there, and it's amazing. Specifically the Stallone version of Judge Dredd. Are these, are these, are these skins? Uh, no, it's actually like different characters in the game. So what will oh, happen okay. is they randomly give you one, and then you can rescue people, and like it's all happening in Vietnam. Um, of course. So you you rescue your comrades from these cages, and then after enough rescues, you unlock a new character, and they'll introduce them as like this is Rambo, you know, and then you know you get to play as him. But basically, like every time you die or start a new level, you get another character, and eventually you have a giant roster of these icons that you can be potentially playing as. So it's very simplistic in the sense that it's basically what run, jump, shoot, um, and then like basically a special that's your grenade. Hmm. And so you have to learn basically like what everyone's weapons are and what their specials are. Um, and it, it's not hard to do, but after a while you'll sort of to like love it when so-and-so pops up because it's like, oh, I love this guy. I can use him this way. Like one yeah. of my, uh, one that I really enjoy is uh, Terminator, um, but portrayed by Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, but it's in his, uh, like he's, his specials instead of throwing a grenade, he goes like invincible. It's like his robot skin comes out. Yeah. And so he can be hit like, you know, a hundred times and not die. And he's got this mini gun that's got this crazy recoil. If you just hold and shoot, it will literally push you back like halfway across the screen constantly. Nice. Um, and just, it's, it's amazing. It's like way over the top. It's, it's clearly meant to be a joke, but it's a fun game. And this is. Where's it available? Uh, Bro Force. It's available on Steam right now. I think it's still early access. Okay. Um, I think it's only like fifteen twenty dollars. It's not bad at all. Um, it, so definitely. It says, is... Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just. I was, I was just gonna just... say. I I'm looking at it. It's also available on the PS4 and the, the PS Vita as well. Oh, I didn't know that. Cool. So, um, but yeah, it is. It is on Steam. Looks like the actual worldwide release is set for 2015. Okay. Um, did you know that the game began? as a game jam entry in 2012 doesn't surprise me i didn't know that but it makes now sense now, now i do <laughs> um and what's interesting about it is for it's all all of its uh, over the top stuff you still pretty much die in one shot so you have to be very strategic about what you're doing um you can kill guys like crazy like it takes nothing but at the same time you still have to be careful about how you're approaching things because one stray bullet can take you out hmm. so it takes a little bit of a kind of clever thought and thinking through levels of how to get through everything would you would you classify this game as a uh, massacre? A what? Massacre game. Massacre. Um, no, I don't think it's that bad. Um, some of the levels start to feel that way, but um, it's easy enough to get through that. I don't think it's you know you don't have to be a masochist to be able to get through it. 
Okay. What are you talking about? Uh, Massacore is a sort of a, a subgenre of a whole bunch of different games where um, it's basically designed to be super hard oh. to get through. Um, and basically you have to be a, a glutton for punishment to want to play through it and get through it because it, it, you're going to die like 80 times before you get to the end of it. It's like Dark Souls. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Dark Souls is yeah. approaching yeah. that. All right. Um, there have also been a lot of mods. Like I think there's like one old uh, you know Super Mario Bros. mod that was kind of a massacre thing um i want to be the guy i think was one uh stuff like that super meat boy super meat boy yeah yeah i honestly don't like that style of game which is why i asked oh fuck no yeah no <laughs> i've uh, got way too much time to spend on stuff like that i, I like too, hard uh, games too but little time <laughs> not games that delight in making it so hard they just kill you constantly uh-huh yeah, no, it's. I mean, I don't mind a hard game, a challenging game, but when it becomes like so obnoxiously hard, I mean, it's just it's not fun anymore. So I don't know. I don't. I don't get that stuff. No, nope. I, I agree. I, I feel like that's. Uh, I don't know who that appeals to. <laughs> um, Rain Man, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> um, so I think this is about a good time for us to go into transition into our uh, main sort of me- meaty topic for today. Um, we were going to talk a little bit about this, Jim. I remember in our last podcast, we didn't quite get around to it, ran out of time. Um, I actually think that works out for the best, though, because I know Ben, like you, is a big comic buff, and uh, this is sort of a good topic for uh, you guys to sort of um, go off on. So we were going to talk a little bit about um, digital comics. Um, it's becoming more and more of a thing recently. Um, I think it's definitely a new media sort of topic because it's digital and it mixes in with um, elements of transmedia. Um, mm-hmm. adaptation to an extent um, because you know you're making print comics but then also making them into potentially digital um, digitally distributed versions of the same thing so I'm curious to get you guys' take on uh, this whole topic so uh, Jim do you have anything to sort of introduce us with as far as the topic is concerned um, well a little background I'm I've been reading comics for since I was I guess 10 years old around there Mm-hmm. Um, so I've been reading for quite some time, but I've only very recently started getting into digital comics, so it's kind of a sh- uh, big shift. Um, I'm not going to claim that I know everything about the distribution methods, so little disclaimer there. Um, but I will say that there's a lot of interesting uh, things that are being done with digital comics. I know in the article that I wrote, I tried to give a little bit of a backstory, a history, because I know digital comics have actually been going um, technically since the 80s, but they really haven't gotten big and, and prevalent until the two, until the 2000s, when yeah, the with bigger the, uh, publishers really started to go for it. If we're sort of embracing mobile and uh, you know iPhone, iPad. And the internet, um, the internet yeah. being the big one. You don't, oh, have, yeah. to, you don't have to put your, uh, your digital comic on a uh, floppy disk anymore. Oh, wow. Sure. Right. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That, um, I have very fond memories of uh, going into Babbage's in the mall <laughs> And buying a CD-ROM of you know X Men one through two hundred. <laughs> yeah. nice, nice, I remember that too. Yeah. And uh, how know, much did that run you, by the way? Just out of curiosity. Oh, it was dirt cheap. It was I think like ten, maybe twenty dollars. That's a yeah, steal. It was yeah. very very cheap. That they, but, they used to be very cheap. The they distinction still, they still being, are if you get the older one. It was uh, comics were still a um, a collector's market. Mm. So comics were still, and this is late eighties, early nineties. Comics were still being sold that. You know, this comic is going to be worth. This is going to send your kids to college. Every <laughs> comic was marketed that way. Oh wow! So to, for them to just dump comics on a CD-ROM and give it to you for cheap was no sweat off their nose. It was mm. money in the couch cushions. Right. It was nothing. Right. Uh huh. Um, it was the physical copy that mattered. Yeah. Yeah. And and that 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 has completely changed. Mm. Um, comics are not investments anymore. Right like that i still think they're overpriced too i mean they're you know, way fucking overpriced yeah, to yeah. to follow one that's in currently in print it's like three or four dollars per issue right it's and, a 2.99 or 3.99 let's know. okay let's break that down a little bit though how long does it take you to read 22 page comic all of like 10 minutes right yeah. well it, for four dollars yeah mm-hmm. it's, it's i would say depending on depends on the book how much text it has and how much you're sort of absorbing the art but at the 
even at the longest end, it's going to take you no more than like 20, 20 to 30 minutes. Yeah. And I'll say too that like, you know, if I just spent three, four dollars on something and this is the one issue I've got right now, I'm a little bit more incentivized to like really sit there and absorb the art, really like take it in. Yeah. But, you know, I, I'm used to reading uh, primarily, you know, manga and kind of book form where you've got, you know, a whole bunch of volumes in one book and I spend ten dollars on it, knock it out in about an hour. But I'm basically reading it like a novel with pictures. Yeah. You know, it's I'm not sitting there and absorbing every single piece of artwork. Well, one of my yeah, I'm a longtime comic fan, uh, reader, uh, and former collector. And th- there was a point in like the early '90s where I decided that you know I was working in a comic book store. Mm-hmm. I was collecting comics. I was bagging them. I was boarding them. I was putting them in long boxes. Mm-hmm. And I realized that I was not buying the stories anymore. Mm. I was buying a prospect that these were going to be valuable, and somehow that valuable that value was going to retroactively justify mm. my expense. Uh, okay. And I had this uh, this one moment where I went back and I read a bunch of runs of issues, and mm. I was like, "This story never ends. It never changes. Mm. There's no arc. Um, I'm being sold something." phony Mm -hmm. and and i quit reading comics for a long time um and you know it was that was the sort of the heyday of of comics having these unending crossovers yeah yeah that were just marketing ploys sure that was the Uh, 90s during the whole bubble that's what you're talking about when it was was really just about them trying to sell variant covers and foil covers and all these little little gimmicks they tried to get you to buy the issues and they're while they're actually there actually were some good stories being, being written. It's just that you had to kind of like wade through all this garbage and you couldn't garbage. really figure out what what was good and what wasn't because they weren't really marketing stories because they were good. They were marketing them because of all these different characters that are going to be in the same issue and they're going to interact and they're going to have mm-hmm. all these and, really and, neat foil wraparound covers and that's why you buy the issue, not because the story's good. Well, right, and, right. and you might be, you know, into several issues of a really great story, story and then the floor drops out of it. Mm. Because now we've got to make way for this crossover from this other title you're not interested in. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know? Um, trying to get you to buy that other title. Yeah. Horseshit. So you know shit. what's going on. Yeah. Um, but uh, recently, uh, pretty much since Comicology sort of made digital comics, uh, you know, one, two, there you go. Yeah. Um, I started reading single issues again. I, I've always not collected, but I'll buy trades and... and like I, I'm never not gonna have the latest and greatest version of Watchmen on my bookshelf. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't really care about a digital version of sure, that. Sure, sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's an interesting topic. Is does Watchmen work digitally? Mm-hmm. I don't think it. It does. Mm-hmm. Well, it, uh, you may not be really gaining anything from it, but you could certainly read it digitally. You could read it, but um, those I, panels are laid out very specifically to be read and consumed. A certain way. Uh, it spreads. Well, that's, yeah. that's what we were talking about earlier uh, before right. we started recording is the, you know, how you consume your digital comics because there's a lot of different ways that they present you with. Uh, the guided view is something that Comixology sort of, I believe, holds a patent on. Um, and the guided view is basically a way for them to uh, zoom into certain panels so that you can see, you can read a comic on a small device like your phone or right. an iPad mini. The problem is, of course, that comics, unless they're specifically digital comics um, and, and digital first comics, they're not really designed for that sort of feature. They're designed right. to be at least one full page. And of course, comics love doing the, the double page spread. Uh-huh. So in order to sort of enjoy that, you either have to have a laptop or that you can sort of turn vertically or a um, an iPad, a full size iPad, because you can get at least the full at least the single page, you can take in the whole single page um, yeah. in one shot. And you still kind of miss out on that two-page spread. And that's where um, definitely there's, there's even to this day, there's there's comics uh, comic artists that put a lot of effort into laying their panels out in a way that is not just telling the story but um, from panel to panel, but also tells a story with the layout and also has this sort of very aesthetic... Um, very artistic way of presenting the story to you in, a, in this visual format. Oh yeah, it's it's an you art just, form. Yeah, you just can't get that on a, on a flat page um, on your on your iPad because even with the iPad because you can only see so much. Yeah, uh-huh. you can never get that double spread. 
I mean, you can technically, but then you kind of have to build into the app the ability to see the double spread and then sort of zoom in on the single page. Right. Um, and even then, you're not getting the same effect as with the physical comic because everything is scaled down and you start to lose some of that definition. You know, it's 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 a different thing when the double spread is jumping out at you on a comic page versus on this little screen of the iPad or the iPhone or whatever else you're using. Mm -hmm. Um and I believe, like, you know, I, I don't have a ton of experience with Comixology, but I think there was a setting I could mess with that would let me um, see a full page and then sort of, like, dive into the panel-by-panel -panel guided view, and then we'll show you the full page again, go to the next page, show the full thing, and then panel-to-panel -panel again. So you still get kind of, like, the one page, sort of, like, here's the layout, but then you start to notice kind of those little quirks about the two-page spreads where, like, I'm seeing Iron Man's leg in this page, and then I see the rest of him in the next page, that sort yeah. of thing. Kind of those weird little quirks. I, you know, I, I was telling you all earlier, I got a uh, Marvel Unlimited subscription, so I've been, like, just consuming mm -hmm. a shit ton of comics, a lot of old stuff. Uh -huh. um, and I've noticed that the, the the older titles haven't been sort of course corrected for guided view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, half a, half a speech bubble will be off the, off the page. So turn off guided view and I'm looking at them and just sort of two finger zooming mm -hmm. in on panels. And I, I realized that, um, you know, when you zoom in on those older comics, they're not meant to be seen at that sort of. Definitely not. Uh, no, of course not. Yeah, and and they look sort of well bad. Well, also think about the work you're putting in with the two finger zoom. You're having to zoom in, zoom out, move, oh, zoom in again. It's really annoying. It's really annoying. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if you are going to make digital comics, you kind of need to design your comic to be compatible with that in a sense. I think and most modern comics are. Yeah. And I think there are some too that do an interesting job. And Jim, I think in your uh, quick thought the other week, um, you showed an example of one where it was basically, you know, what might have been two different panels before is now essentially one panel with more word bubbles that pop up and essentially like the fire that's burning goes down. Right. And so you're still, it's, it's kind of like a dynamic sort of animation, so to speak within the same panel yeah. instead of being multiple panels. Yeah. They call that, um, dynamic comic or dynamic view. I forget which, um, it's something that, that DC has been working on with their, uh, digital line of comics. They have this line known as uh, digital first uh -huh. and the concept being, um, all these comics are designed first to be read on a digital um, device, like an iPad um, or or an iPhone or a, you know your PC, um, and then later they release a full trade version in print for those that want them. And the one specifically that has been experimenting with this that I read is called Batman sixty six, mm -hmm. and it's a um, an adaptation um, of the original Adam West TV series, <laughs> um, going for the same style of humor. It's actually quite funny. Nice. Um, uh, the artist, I, I, I want to say, I want to say the writer is Jeff Parker, and I can't remember who the artist is. And I will look him up right now because it's going to kill me. Let's see. Are you going to get the Blu-rays, Jim? Uh, the Blu-rays? Um, <laughs> I don't have a Blu-ray player, but um, I what? actually right, I still don't. But I do actually want to get the, um, the DVDs at least because my copy of the of the series, I do I do own the series, um, but they're just VHS rips that I've ripped mm -hmm. digitally. Because um, I, I love the series so much, I grew yeah. up watching it. Um, I, I I can't wait. <laughs> high on my uh, birthday birthday gift list. Very nice. Yeah, it's it's fantastic. I, I I absolutely love it, and the comic is really great too. Yeah. Uh, Mike Allred is is the artist. Oh, does the is uh, he really? He did for several of the issues. Uh, I don't okay. believe he's currently the, still the artist, but he still yeah. does all the covers. He 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 is the creator of Mad Men. Yes, he is, and yeah. he's he does a great job with the art. Um, um, at least That's all, all the covers that I've seen. Yeah, it really is. And then the other artists that they bring in, they try to get them to sort of mimic his style. Obviously, okay. not all of them can. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I was right. Jeff Parker uh, writes a series. Um, Jeff Parker, you might remember him from Thunderbolts. At least that's how I remember him. But I haven't read all of his stuff. Yeah. Um, I, let's see. Yeah. But anyway, so what they do with the, with the dynamic view is um, essentially they kind of repeat the same panels, but they change things slightly so that when you're cycling to the next image, it seems like there's a little bit of a uh, little bit of motion and action going on. So for example, um, you see you see say Batman um, swinging in on like his his grapple line in one part and then you see the exact same you go to the next quote page and the panel has changed slightly. Batman's a little like um, has gone all the way to the other side and he's you know connected his foot with say a, one of penguin's minions and uh you see like the big 
bam or like ka, ka flap or whatever sort of like you know digital um digital um onomatopoeia of the um <laughs> of whatever sound the the, the attack the impact right, so it right, kind of right. adds a little little interest and they do the same thing with word bubbles too sometimes someone will walk into a room and the word bubbles will only appear for the, per- the first person that's going to talk and then you go to the next page and the next word bubble comes up so it kind of adds a little bit of of um action to the still image and um, I remember mentioning before we got started too uh, that that sort of thing reminded me of, and there's a bit of a distinction between here the uh, dynamic comics that you're talking about, Jim, and the uh, the motion comics that I've seen. Uh, right. Metal Gear Solid is a good example of one they have on I think the PSP, and there's also a print version at one point. But um, you'd have still still frames, but you'd have a bit of sort of artificial animation added to it. Where, for instance, you know, you're bringing a gun up to bear, and the hand would come in from the bottom of the panel, kind of like it's being raised up. And then there's kind of a blow, blow, blow. They might add sounds. Um, you know, there's sometimes voice acting in these things. Um, there'd be like you know recoil on the hand, but the hand itself and the gun aren't really moving. They might just like you know add and take away like a still one frame muzzle flash or something like that. But um, it's kind of interesting because it adds a bit more of a movie like quality even though you can still tell it's a comic yeah if you actually go on netflix they actually have some uh, motion comics on netflix yeah um, oh, nice. joss whedon's astonishing yeah, uh, yeah so it's it's pretty much as you described it and they actually for for those motion comics like like the astonishing x-men uh, that they do have they take images from uh the actual art from the comic mm-hmm. but they add that sort of that sort of like faux motion kind of really low budget animation type look to it sure, yeah. so that it gives it a little bit of motion you have the sounds sound effects added in um honestly i don't really like motion comics i think that all of that added fluff makes them distracting but um maybe I that's hate them <laughs> yeah I, I, i'm i don't like them so i'm, I'm yeah. kind of with you on that one ben but mm. um dynamic comics though at least from work when i've been reading batman 66 i think it's it adds the right amount of of motion without actually ruining the feel of a comic and i especially think it's, it's kind of cool instead of having you know like four side by side frames it's basically the same thing with like a slight like you know sort of faux animation that they try to build into the still frames just having that be one frame that changes in four different states um it's almost a more efficient way of sort of presenting it in a sense even though if you're still looking at the full page you've got those four panels side by side yeah and i think the the one that's actually one of the problem that i have with certain um, certain comic creators that that do that, where they just have basically the, they reuse panels a lot and they show the same um, yeah. the same images. I know Bendis does this a lot, and I, I Brian Michael Bendis. Um, I I'm not a fan, uh, but you I hear that, that Bendis. I'm calling you out. No, uh, he, he tends to. Um, I, I like some of his like earlier stuff, okay, but he he has a really bad habit of making his comic panel layouts. Whatever artist he works with is always the same, so I know it has to be him. Um, he has a tendency to make them almost like they're storyboards for a film as opposed oh, okay. to actually a comic book. And right. I think that kind of ruins um, the storytelling potential and narrative potential of a comic book if you just look at them as storyboards. Because well, they can t- be so much more. That sure. touches on a, on, on a tangential issue is that a lot of modern comics now are storyboards for movies in a sense. Right, because of the movies being adapted from comics and vice versa. Yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, I think Mark Millar, who is a, a, a giant uh, turd, um, in I won't te- argue that either. <laughs> technical parlance, uh, <laughs> sells a screenplay before the comic even hits the stands, mm. mm-hmm. um, which is kind of crazy. I mean, I can't. Uh, the way that the the pop culture has embraced comics, uh, you know, I, I think, in my humble opinion, has has sort of uh, ruined comics a little bit. Well, there's the question, too, of has yeah. the public really embraced comics or have they embraced comic characters? You know, going to see them in movies, you know, the whole Marvel movie universe, um, in a way, kind of having its own sort of thing that's separate from the car- Marvel comics. No, you're, you're, totally, I mean, you're totally right, Chris, because I, yeah. yeah. I, I don't think that in terms of readership, um, you can, you'll still see a bump, for, like, for example... Um, after the Guardians movie, there was a bump in the sales of uh, the Guardians of the Galaxy comic, right. which unfortunately they were reading the current Bendis version, which is not good. <laughs> uh, so, instead of the, uh, of the superior Abnett and Lenning uh, from 2008 Guardians comic, oh. but um, 
you do see that bump. I know that, for example, um, Marvel was running a uh, storyline to kind of sew that, that back and forth um, recently uh, known as Superior Spider-Man, and the idea was that Dr. Octopus had um, taken over Spider-Man's body after he was going to die. They switched places. It, it, you can't. You don't. You kind of have to like. You know, suspension of disbelief. Obviously, sure. it's a ridiculous concept. That, that's he's, a, comics, he's a Spider Man. <laughs> yes, but uh, he's a Spider Man. It's already kind of ridiculous. The point is, <laughs> the point is that Doctor Octopus essentially becomes Spider Man for all intents and purposes. He's inside Peter Parker's body, uh-huh. and um, this storyline was meant to run for longer than it actually did. It only lasted, I think, thirty issues. I want to yeah. say. And the reason why it was cut short was because the Amazing Spider Man two film was about to hit theaters and marvel wanted that bump for for people reading it to not get confused and go well what's going on who is this why is Otto octavius spider-man i thought it was peter parker oh yeah so, so they're, they they're aware the, of their yeah right so they they ended the storyline early and then they rebooted um not really a reboot it's just they re-released the number one um issue of peter parker coming back as as spider-man and they released amazing the amazing spider-man number one um, and it sold, I think it was, oh geez, it was like 630,000, it was like a ridiculous number of issues. Yeah. Um, it was way, 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 super, super number one. And <laughs> now that, that's not super strange for Spider-Man, by the way, yeah. a number one to be number one, because usually the top sellers in comics are Batman, Spider-Man, and um, then others. So Batman and Spider-Man tend to be in yeah. the top ten pretty much every time. The, the flagships for DC and Marvel, respectively, yeah. Right, but even with that, there was still a bump for Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. I, I would almost rather they never release the sales figures for number one issues and just tell me how number two did. Mm. You oh, know, I think, yeah. There's no yeah. Like, huge drop-off, well, too. Tell us how the arc did, even. You know, yeah. Oh, yeah. How, how did the whole thing do? No. The comics at this point are basically just peripheral marketing for the films which i find really odd because it, it really cheapens the, the medium too. of comics yeah don't yeah. and don't forget tell because television's a big one too and there's there's a lot of um not just you know things like cartoons uh, yep. live action has been starting to get pretty big i know dc is kind of going all in with the live action uh television uh, series now gotham yeah well they have a lot coming out they have gotham and constantine are about to release the flash about to release <laughs> They uh, already have Arrow, and they have yeah, Arrow, I think, yeah. they have about I want to say seven or eight other series that they're in production. Marvel yep. has several in production for Netflix as well. So, and of course, well, Marvel currently has Agents of Shield Agents and of Shield. and yeah. Peggy Carter. Um, mm, oh yeah. I, the difference, the big difference, being uh, Agents of Shield and Peggy Carter are directly related to the films. Mm-hmm. That's um, true. Whereas the DC universe is, is not, it's all partitioned off. Uh, I think I think to its detriment. Well, I, I don't know. Is Gotham trying to be kind of a prequel to Nol- or Christopher Nolan's Batman? No, it's not. Okay, it's supposed to be a prequel to Batman. Just okay. the concept Just Batman. of Batman in, in general, but okay. not Ben Affleck Batman. Mm. Okay. Um. I yeah. I, I don't know. Uh, and it's it interesting because so weird in a way. You know, because the the people who are most likely, I think, to watch the TV shows are those who, you know, like the movies. You know, the people who've seen the movies want the TV shows to be related. And so I think it's almost like Marvel's kind of doing it smart, I think, in a way, because it does tie in directly to the movies. There's kind of like this, you know, TV slash movie universe that Marvel's created that, you know, personally, like I'm following that more closely than I am any of the comics because I'm not a big comic reader myself, um, even though I'm kind of aware of what's happening in comic land, so to speak. Well, I- in a sense, what Marvel's doing with their films and, and, and TV show, even though I'm not a huge fan of Agents of Shield, mm-hmm. um, neither am I. Yeah, don't get me started <laughs> on that. Actually. I, yeah, it, uh, um, it's not good. I, I respect the approach, but it's got Jeff Loeb's dirty fingerprints all over yeah. it. Yeah. Oh. Um, but uh, you know, I, I did like when Winter Soldier came out, and then there were these episodes of Agents of Shield that dealt with the dissolution of Shield. Mm-hmm. I checked in. I'm interested. I want to see what's going on. Yeah, what, what happens here? Yeah, I think that's just from a business standpoint, very interesting. Definitely, and, and, and transmedia. Definitely transmedia for sure. I was just about to say that. I mean, um, I, I think transmedia does have a future for people who are interested in keeping up with their favorite IPs through a number of different ways. You know, you go see the big blockbuster release of this movie that's like going to have all these big revelations. Almost treat it like kind of like a big special for your you know TV show that you're following. Yeah. And then the TV show is kind of the thing that carries you between big movie releases. I think there's something um, that might take off there here well, pretty soon. 
I, I'm, I'm constantly having this debate with, with the, uh, God, I hate to hear myself say it, but the avant-garde theater group that I'm, <laughs> I'm a part of, All right. um, who, who sort of believe that, that narrative is, is not really important. Mm. And I disagree with that. And I think that we're seeing now with, with the way Marvel does their movies, the way Star Wars is going to be doing their IP, the way, um, Shows are unfurled on Netflix and Amazon Prime and in big chunks that yeah. that we as a culture are trending toward long form narrative. Yeah, yeah, and that we want more continuity. Mm-hmm. We want longer stories. Right. We don't want episodes, and we don't want little bubbles that mm-hmm. don't matter. Because I mean, how many of us binge watch now? You know, Everybody. I mean, like you know, yeah. Netflix. You know, people sometimes. They, well, I think we talked about this, Jim, and with uh, Richard. When we were talking about uh, Orange is the New Black and shows like that being released in full seasons on Netflix. And House of Cards, and, and it, there's yep. a bunch of new ones that are coming, and, too. And we were talking about how, you know, maybe you lose something, we don't have that week in between to talk to people about it. But at the same time, I mean, I know that when I sit down to watch a TV show, I want to sit down and watch, you know, many episodes at a time, if not the whole thing, in the course of a couple of days. Awesome. I know I, I want to get the whole story knocked out and move on. Also, above how you enjoy that, mm-hmm. The ultimate idea is that they've given you the agency to control it. Right. Yeah. So if you don't like watching all 12 episodes of Orange is the New Black or whatever. You don't have to. You don't have to. You can watch it week by week, month yeah. by month, whatever. Yeah. That It's really on you. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I, I, I think is, is really smart. Yeah. I agree. Recently been binge watched um, a show called, if you guys heard of Holt and Catch Fire. Yeah. Yeah. Is, that, was, is that any good? Yeah. I really enjoyed it. It's basically really? yeah. It is. It is a. Um, it's sort of a. It's, it's almost like a side story to the computer sort of revol- early computer revolution back in the eighties. And um, one of the characters is clearly based off of Steve Jobs, and the other is clearly based off of Wozniak. Uh, Steve who, Jobs. Is who is Ronan the Accuser? Um, <laughs> uh, Ronan the Accuser was uh, the Steve Jobs guy. I forgot his name. Um, the the actor or the character? Uh, the actor. Lee Pace. He's from here. Oh, from Dallas Area? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. I'm checking right now, so it's... Let's see. He, uh, he was also um, Legolas' he, father. Honestly, I'll say that he does a great job as that as that character. Um, hold on, let me get his name real quick. You're talking uh, about Joe, this. Joe McMillan. Joe McMillan is the name of the character. And uh, Lee Pace does a great job playing that character. Um, I don't think that in, in the film Guardians of the Galaxy, which I really enjoyed, um, but I don't think that Lee Pace, his acting was really tested with playing Ronan. Ronan didn't really have much of a character. Did I mean, he kind of did some stuff, but you really, I didn't really feel like uh, Lee Pace was able to put his personal thumbprint on that character. Yeah, um, because I, I the, think... The focus was on, was, on the, was on the Guardians themselves, and I think we did a yeah. good job with those characters. I, I also wonder, like, when they were writing it, um, or when James Gunn was writing it, did they make that choice so that they could have that moment at the end when uh, Star-Lord challenges him to a dance-off <laughs> for him to completely break character. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, I don't know. But, uh, Star-Lord of the dance. He, he, is, a, he is a very, uh, well, you know, you read comics, he's a very uh, typical Cree in that sense. Yeah. Uh, and he is true to the comics. I mean, he's one of the most visually film uh, comic to film accurate representations of a character so is Thanos mm-hmm. I mean it, 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 it's so funny to watch DC kind of flop around uh-huh. with making Wonder Woman wear brown and I don't know whatever that was Xena costume <laughs> and then they just throw fucking Thanos just like he's purple deal with it yeah in, <laughs> in a in a you know uh, in a big throne in a big you know uh-huh. Yeah, the meteorite throne. Yeah, yeah. I think I think DC kind of got a little scared after um, the return for Green Lantern because they tried to do all of these. <laughs> they tried to do all these like kooky aliens, but they did them all with CG, and it didn't work. People didn't really like the film, even though I don't really think it was that bad considering how oh, much it was. Oh, the film was bad. It was. I never saw it. It so. wasn't a good film, but I don't think that it's deserving to say be put in the same class as something like. 
Catwoman or Electra. I don't think it's like that terrible, like Batman and Robin. Oh, I'll show you. Uh, I'll show you why it's that terrible. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's got a huge narrative thrust where he he talks about how he's not earned the right to be Green Lantern because he's so afraid mm. over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. That's not fun to watch. Nobody wants to see that, well, especially we, we since had- the character is a guy who is dis- dispossessed of fear. But mm. I, I think I think that could have worked. There's a lot of things in that movie that could have worked, but they just didn't because of the way that they, the way that they were executed. Because Spider Man Two was essentially a movie about Peter Parker not wanting to be Spider Man, but it was also a great movie. So yeah. it it just it's it's execution. It's and I think it was poorly yeah, executed. The, the trick is not to like beat your audience over the head at the blunt end of the premise. You know, that's a borrow a phrase from Homestar Runner. Um, you know, like telling us over and over again what the character's struggle is doesn't make it more meaningful. It just bores us. Right. You know, show don't tell. Show us exactly. Let's see it. Yeah. Also, I, I I would like a moratorium on any cloud-based villains. Any yeah. villains that are represented <laughs> as giant floating clouds <laughs> that was coming that. coming somewhere to do something cloud bad. Based villains. Uh, um, I I think um, I'm anti that. There's actually a little. Uh, I just found this a little interesting tie between with uh, the comics and the Holt and Catch Fire show that I brought up. Um, Scoot McNeary, the guy who plays Gordon Clark, which is the um, Wozniak uh, sort of character, he's Isn't also it? playing Jimmy Olsen in the Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. Has that has that been confirmed? Because I've heard different it's, things. It was confirmed. Yeah, he's Jimmy Olsen. He's Jimmy Olsen. See, I heard he might be Metallo. Um, really? Or, because or I, worse, Flash. <laughs> or worse. Um, is I, is that really for, is that really for worse? Um, well, uh, how that rumor got started, he is in the film. Yeah. Oh, he um, is. But but there were pictures of him with sort of green screen socks on mm-hmm. from from the legs down, indicating that something was going to be CG'd in later. Hmm. Um, and so. The immediate reaction was, oh, he's the Flash. But I don't know why they would CG his legs from the knees down as the Flash. That doesn't make sense. Yeah, I need the whole leg. Honestly, yeah. I mean... <laughs> and he's wearing, like, business casual mm. sort of, you know, well, clothes from the knee up. Look, looking at him um, without his beard, he has a beard on throughout the entire Hold and Catch Fire series. But uh, looking at him without the beard, I actually could see him play Barry Allen. I mean, it's it's not like that bad of a casting, at least from an no, appearance no. standpoint. And he is a good actor. Um, but uh, I I'd also heard that maybe he was going to be Metallo, who Lex Luthor had given you know prosthetic bionic limbs to. Right, right. See you that? know John that Corbin. he had lost his legs. Not sure where Jimmy Olsen where Jimmy Olsen would need CG legs at all. You know what I mean? Wasn't there a Jin, a Ginny Olsen in Man of yeah. Steel? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, um, which I thought, I know when that first came out, people were asking if they had recast, the, like reimagined the characters as, as a female version. And then people started pointing out that Jimmy Olsen back in the, uh, in the sixties and seventies used to do a lot of cross dressing. Court- <laughs> wait, 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 wait. You, okay, you became kind of a meme for a while. You, do not, were you not aware of this? He used to do it for, for, for stories. It was only for, for um, investigative uh-huh. journalism. Like, he would go uh-huh. out, he would direct... <laughs> Purely uh, for the job. Yeah, I, you can't make this stuff up, right? Yeah. So he, he dresses... I, I'm pretty sure that this was in some of the uh, Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen book um, as well. I love that name, by the way. <laughs> Superman's pal. Yeah, Superman's, Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, pretty uh, big. Um, actually, a pretty pretty popular book once uh, Kirby got a hold of it. Yeah. And uh, Jimmy was known for wearing a bunch of disguises, and one of his common disguises really was dressing as a woman. So he would go undercover, and he would—I guess that would help him get pictures dressed as a woman. I don't know. So mm-hmm. some people were saying that maybe they were going to try to to play off Jenny Olsen as like actually jimmy somehow i i don't know oh because i remember her in man of steel i, I mean she's yeah. very clearly a very attractive woman yeah uh don't crying game me uh, um it's, superman it, movie <laughs> maybe it's, it's jimmy post-op that would be good just putting it out I, there they could just make jenny olsen i mean just do it yeah who i don't cares? know why not yeah, who cares really? i don't know why not i mean i think i think that I don't. I don't think there's any problem with having a Jimmy Jimmy Olsen character as well, though. I think that you don't have to limit yourself. No. Um, 
same thing. With, I, they've already changed the the dynamic between Superman and Lois anyway. Yeah, for the better. Um, I, think. I, I think so. I mean, I, I like I like their dynamic in the film more than I like the way that they're they're presented in the comics currently because Superman is actually paired with Wonder Woman in the comics right now, mm. um, which I, I I kind of like and dislike because. Um, Charles Soleil, who uh, recently signed exclusive for Marvel, but he's going to finish out his run on DC. He's currently writing the Superman Wonder Woman uh, book, it's like a a book that for both characters. And he actually does a really good job portraying their uh, their relationship, and their they kind of play off each other really well. So you know, I, I I do kind of like that interaction, but I miss the Lois Lane and Superman um, the the sort of character dynamic that they had, the chemistry that they had was usually yeah. one of the best parts of the Superman comics. I, I just can't get past it because it's so integral to Superman, mm. Lois Lane. Yeah. What I, what I, you know, one of those shipping sort of things that I loved, shipping ret- retcons was in the Justice League cartoon. It was Wonder Woman and Batman yeah. that had a sort of unspoken thing. I love mm. that too. That's fucking brilliant. <laughs> I think personality-wise, I think that they fit. Either, either that or Aquaman and Wonder Woman because they both have that regal sort of like royalty oh. element well if if you've seen or read flashpoint paradox that doesn't end well <laughs> true <laughs> that's true yeah uh, shipping they might be a little too similar yeah no i think the batman and wonder woman i mean batman is he's a bachelor you know he's <laughs> got, he, he doesn't have a a, a a female character that is his lowest lane ever i mean mm-hmm. vicky vale would be the closest he, but he has multiples that, that he's with for a while <laughs> i think the closest um that, that he's gotten to it probably been Catwoman and Talia. Yeah. Um, and he's currently with Catwoman in the comics from what I can tell. God, that bugs me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, she, she's, she's kind of be, been reimagined as a more, not, I wouldn't go so far as to say heroic, but kind of has an anti-hero. She's, she's yeah, had her own it, book it, for a while. It's always ended with the Dark Knight trilogy for better or for worse. So. <sighs> well, she's been doing that in comics actually for some time. Yeah, long, but long I mean, I'm saying the Dark it, trilogy. It, it's it just makes so sense, predictable. Though, it makes sense that the current run, though, is you know coming after the Dark Knight trilogy that they would do that. So, um, anyway, it's probably about time for us to start, start wrapping up. So, uh, do you guys have any closing comics or uh, comics? <laughs> closing <laughs> comics. Speaking of Aquaman. comics, <laughs> there you go. Uh, any closing uh, comments here before we wrap up? Um, no, I think I think uh, we've talked a lot about the uh, digital comics and how they are actually a new media. And which I do actually agree with. I do think that there's some interesting things that can still be done with comics. And I think if, if both of the, the main publishers, the big publishers, not just Marvel and DC, but also you know Dark Horse, Image, yeah. um, if these if these big publishers can experiment in the digital digital comic space, experiment with uh, the way that comic stories are told, the way the narratives are told, not just delivered to us, but the way that they're that they're told, um, I think that you could see uh, you could see a resurgence in comics or comic reading. Um, but you have to give people that don't read comics a reason to jump on board and you have to advertise it. And I'm not seeing enough of that advertising and I'm hmm. not seeing enough experimentation. I'm seeing a little bit here and there, but I'd like to see them go full, full on, you know, put a lot of money into it and try to try to get readers through that. Through well, that along, along those same lines, I think we're seeing a very nascent version of what digital comics could be. Oh yeah. Uh, I definitely, mean, definitely. I'm sort of excited how how they'll be in 20 years. Yeah. Um, uh, and along the same lines as as, as uh, the financial considerations go, these need to be way cheaper. They yeah. need to be well below impulse purchase like, price point. Or if, 99 cents iTunes. Yeah, yeah, if not that, it needs to be like season pass, like 20 bucks. I get this entire run well, that's, for all the upcoming episodes. That's the beauty of Marvel Unlimited. Mm. I mean, it's 70 bucks a year and you get their entire library. Right. But with like a you, six six month lag. Right, uh-huh. yeah. And like, and like you said, though, there are there is some issue with that when you're looking at older books. So there's still some like, you know, growing pains in that service. Yeah. Um, plus the whole six month lag thing is something that might be more of a barrier for some people to jump on because they might feel like um, they're missing out. So I do think if they if they if they keep that service and then release some of their newer stuff in a more of a like a ninety nine cent kind of impulse buy, get people back into it. Yeah. Well I think where where they've really sort of fucked up is I think Marvel Unlimited needs to be paired with their Marvel digital comic service so that you have if you're a, a subscriber, maybe you have access to the library 
six month lag, but also within the app, the ability to purchase. Right. Yeah. At, at, at a substantial discount. Yeah, at a discount for sure. I mean, yeah. I think if, if they do that and they say, hey, if you have this service, um, not only do you get all these back issues, but you also get this discount on new stuff, I think there'd be a lot more people jumping on board. Totally, yeah. Cool. Yep. All right. Well, I think that will do it for us today. Um, thanks, Ben, again for joining us. It's been a good conversation. Thanks for having me. And uh, thanks, Jim, for uh, hopping on from Houston. It's been yep. good to have you here, too. Good to be here, but in spirit. Cool, cool. Yeah, the, uh, the spirit of the Internet coming back full circle again. So, yeah, so uh, for Ben and for Jim, I'm Chris. And thanks again for joining us on the Backward Compatible podcast. And we'll see you next time. We want you to join the discussion on our website, backward-compatible.com. You bring a unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment in our podcast section, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This time, let us know how you consume comics. Reader or moviegoer, collector or downloader, we want to hear your take on the state of the industry. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible.